and then we start. Good morning, everybody. Um, since this is the last semester, uh, the last uh, seminar of the year, I would like <laughs> I would like to take you on a journey through the most fascinating ob observations made in physics, which are actually the reasons why I really love physics, and um, I would like to stick to experimental observations rather than going into the pretty abstract theories just to keep it as simple as possible and um, I find physics most exciting in the context of philosophical questions and of course physics and philosophy are very closely related and the common thread that should connect all the uh, observations we will look at is uh, how real is reality that means we're asking for the true nature of phenomena and um, when we approach the subject reality it might be the simplest to start from points of things where we would all agree that they are not real yeah dreams and hallucinations everybody would agree this is unreal but also, if somebody plays a trick on our perception, we would probably not consider that very real. Uh, the last point is a little bit more subtle. Um, we have a very strong tendency to project all our hopes and fears onto the outer world, which does not per se turn the outer world unreal, but it highly biases our perception. Yeah, so what is reality then itself? So um, I want to take uh, this rubber duck as a representative of uh, reality, of all the things that we perceive. And we, all the things we perceive, they have a size, they have a weight, a color. I, if I would lick at it, it would have probably not such a nice taste. It has sort of a solidity, probably an age. Yeah, so all uh, qualities that you can measure and uh, quantify. But probably we would expect a little bit more from this rubber duck to be considered real and this should be permanent, for example, that it should not disappear tomorrow and if something changes on it, it should happen for a good reason, yeah, causality. So then we would expect that if I perceive it, you also perceive it. That means objectivity. It should exist also by itself, right? So it um, should not only be here because I hold it. If I put it down and look away, it disappears. You know, these would all things that would render it rather uh, unreal. Then we look a little bit more broader. We perceive an uh, enormous uh, variety of things, yeah? a lot of differences, a lot of uh, phenomena. And if we zoom into reality here, so this is an overview of the structure of matter, um, we will see that a lot of these things disappear, kind of. Yeah? So what we will see in the end is that things are in some way are real and unreal at the same time. So I probably don't have to convince everybody in here that everything we perceive is made of atoms, which are tiny little things that are made of even more tiny things like the nucleus and the electrons surrounding it. And already at this point, at this early point of our journey, we realize we are already at the crossroads of reality because I personally never perceived something like an atom. And so already here a gap shows up between the way we perceive reality and the way it is actually, or it truly is. But if we continue, we see the nucleus is made out of uh, neutrons and protons. These in turn are made of quarks and gluons keeping the quarks together. So, the basic particles can be considered these uh, electron and quark, and what is written here that the size is smaller than 10 to the minus 18 meters, which is fairly small. If a single hydrogen atom would have the size of our planet, 
then the electrons and quarks would have a size like an orange or a melon in that range. Yeah, so already very small. But if you ask a particle physicist today, they would tell you quarks and electrons don't actually have a size. And the reason why this value is uh, always listed is um, that's as far as we can measure. It's not possible to measure in higher accuracy than that because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So how can it be that we perceive a solid reality out there while essentially there's nothing or hardly anything in there? And just an example here with a juggler that is juggling fireballs. If you take a picture of this juggler with a very short exposure time, you would see exactly the juggler with two balls somewhere around him. If you extend the exposure time, the things, uh, the fireballs get blurry like here, and if you would further increase the exposure time, you would see one big fireball. So in some sense, our perception of reality is very much determined first by the resolution of our perception, but very much also of the time window in which we can perceive change. Yeah, if we would perceive things very precisely, we would see that everything is constantly vibrating because of temperature and everything is uh, circulating as well. Yeah? On the other hand, if we could perceive change on the scale of hundreds or thousands of years, we would see that even mountains are constantly changing in this very moment. Just they do it very, very slow, so we also cannot perceive that level of change. So the impression of solidity and permanence very much results from our limited time window in which we can perceive change. And what's, what also becomes apparent is um, all the variety that we perceive in the outer world totally collapses. Yeah, in the outer world, we see millions of millions different impressions. Yeah, colors, sizes, shapes, uh, smells, sounds, enormous variety. And on that level, it shows up that everything is made out of the same five hand of this handful of particles, like electrons, quarks, and these exchange particles that keep them together. So there's hardly any variety on that level. And it gets even worse, not yet. Um, so one of the particles is the quark, and for German speakers this closely resembles a word for uh, fresh cheese. So, but the term comes actually from the Irish writer James Joyce, who did not really write classical stories, but more described our internal dialogue, and in his book Finnegan's Wake you find the sentence three quarks from Muster Mark which as such does not make too much sense. But it turns out that he picked up this uh, word when he was traveling through Germany on German markets where people offered fresh cheese. So it actually comes from quark. And there's something very peculiar about these quarks. If we look here, we see a, a proton that consists of two up quarks that have a charge of two-third and a down quark, which has a charge of minus one-third. And the funny thing about them is they cannot exist alone. Quarks can only exist in pairs or triplets. So you will never find a single quark. That turns actually this proton the most stable particle in the universe and 90% of the cosmic radiation are actually protons traveling pretty quickly through space. And But it's not totally true that they're together forever. You can break a proton in pieces, you can rip them apart, but you need so much energy that by ripping it apart, immediately new particles appear. So they always are in pairs or triplets. Yeah, so um, that is totally against our intuition, yeah, because in our normal world of perception, there's no such thing that only exists because something else is there. You know, that makes them totally dependent on each other. And this gets even worse uh, because in the microcosmos there are absolutely no uh, differences allowed. Yeah, uh, this fellow would have probably liked that a lot. 
So uh, just as a side note, this remarkable monument is actually not far from here in the neighboring city of uh, Chemnitz. And uh, yeah, Karl Marx. But here the equality goes uh, that far that even something like age is not allowed. There's no such thing as age. And if we look at humans, we can immediately tell their probability of decay by counting the numbers of wrinkles or gray hairs or something like that. But if we look, for example, at a nucleus that is uh, undergoing a decay, there's absolutely no difference between a nucleus that will decay in the very next moment to one that will decay in a hundred years. Absolutely no difference. And it also means that there's no cause ex uh, for this decay. It just happens because it's possible. And it was that which uh, Einstein absolutely disliked. Excuse me. Yeah, Einstein did not like that because that means there is no cause for the decay. And that means there's a, no determinism in this. And he really did not like that. And it's actually his dislike that was leading to a lot of the discoveries that we will look at right now. But first I want to come to a couple of fundamental misunderstandings. First. They're all around the Higgs boson, and the first misunderstanding is actually the Higgs boson is not a particle, it's actually uh, a brand of beer with a not so beautiful picture maybe of Peter Higgs on top of it. The, the fundamental misunderstanding is actually, and this is why it is here, that particles do not have a mass themselves. We always think electrons, quarks, whatever, they have a mass, but they get it. They don't have it themselves, it's something they obtain by interacting with the all-pervading Higgs field. And that was uh, something that was found out in 2013 at CERN, which at that time uh, was very uh, much in the media. Um, to some respect also to the third uh, misunderstanding, and that is the label as a God particle. Yeah, that was. Uh, probably contributing to its fa fame quite a bit. And um, the Higgs boson as such has absolutely nothing to do with a creating God. Yeah, neither does prove it or disprove it. It was uh, actually in 93 that two American physicists wrote a book and they called the book The God Damn Particle. And that was because the Higgs boson was predicted in 1964 by Peter Higgs and five other physicists and nobody could find it. So this so-called standard model of particle physics was never really complete and due to that frustration they gave the book the title The Goddamn Particle which in the US is a little bit of a critical thing because you have quite an influential conservative Christian community there. And therefore, the publishers turned it around and called it the God Particle, which was actually an excellent public relation trick as well. So we saw already that there's hardly any size or mass in particles, and now we want to look at the essential qualities like color and all these other things. So I made a little uh, sketch here illustrating the process of uh, perceiving color. Yeah, so there's a source of light that produces photons which are reflected by some kind of matter and then come to our sense organ, the eye, where in the back we have these receptors that turn this photon then into an electrochemical gradient which then travels through this complex network of neurons and the information is processed at different places, filtered um, compared to previous experience and somewhere in our brain then this image of the rubber duck appears. So it is not something that's really out there, it is something our brain creates, it is painted by our brain. So it is a subtle but fundamental misconception that we think this rubber duck is out here. 
it is an image that our brain in this moment creates. And that's the same for any kind of perception, actually. So if we look at all the points we listed before, it turns out if we look very closely to it, hardly anything remains when you zoom into the structure of matter. And um, yeah, that's maybe not the uh, nicest take-home message for a Christmas lecture, but there's also the magic. But we have a situation here because we have a German physicist talking about magic, so that already may sound a little bit awkward, but we have to do it then in a very structured way. That means we fuse the entire magic into two bullet points, and that is uh, everything is totally transformable and there's no separation between things. And actually here's the magician who uh, started it all. He does not look very exotic, not at all like Dumbledore or something, but we really have to thank him for every of these uh, observations that we will look at. And uh, he d didn't have a wand or something of that kind. He had a formula. A formula everybody will know, even the Bild Zeitung used this formula as an advertisement for its uh, um, magazine stating simply genius. So uh, probably the common knowledge about this um, formula is pretty vague. It's basically simplifications or projections. But what does it really mean then? And what it means is that these two images are actually showing the same kind of thing. And what we see here on the left is an electron and a positron. So it's a particle and an antiparticle, which are the same kind of particle, except that they have opposite charge. And if they meet, if they come together, they transform into a photon. So before there were two particles having something like mass. Now we have a photon that has no mass. That's a total transformation because something that has a mass can rest or it can move with a certain velocity smaller than the speed of light. Something without mass can only move with the speed of light and has totally different behavior. And if this photon has enough energy, it itself can decay into a pair of particle and antiparticle. Not only electrons, I was using here the big brother of the electron, the muon, as an example. But basically any kind of particle could appear here yeah, because each particle has an antiparticle. So everything is totally transformable. If you would see this in the outer world, this would really mean you can turn a person into a rabbit or a rubber duck or something like that. Yeah, so uh, total transformability. But this is still this kind of Harry Potter magic, I turn you into a rubber duck or something like that. Uh, but it goes much further than that, and to understand that we have to read this formula with kinetic energy. That means motion. If you put motion in that equation, then it means that you can create mass from motion, and you can turn motion into mass, or the other way around, mass into motion. Which may sound weird, but here we are. Welcome to the dark side of the force. And everybody knows what this is. And this process is uh, driven by the transformation of mass to motion. Yeah, if you have a very large nucleus and it decays into two parts, then some of the mass is lost in some way. It is transformed into the kinetic energy, the motion of these two parts. And this is uh, giving this process, process its force. Yeah, so you can turn mass to motion, but also the opposite is possible, and that happens in the particle accelerators. Yeah, for example, CERN, you have this 27 kilometer long ring under the Earth, which uh, accelerates particles. That means it uh, increases their kinetic energy. So in one point, these uh, beams are meeting, and the p particles are supposed to collide. That's where these giant uh, detectors are built, which often are multiple stories high. And they uh, take these kind of pictures. Yeah? So they make all the things that appear 
and the collision visible. And in this moment the kinetic energy is transformed into mass. And I want to uh, describe that with one experiment that was done from 1989 to 2000 at CERN. They used electrons and positrons at that time to collide. And there were some events which were called elastic scattering. That means the electrons that came in just slightly touched and came out again. So what goes in comes out. But that's not all that comes out. Additionally, you find a lot of particles being created. Yeah, you call these streams of particles jets. And that means these particles did not exist before. They were not part of the electrons. The electron is not a big bag containing all these particles and they spread it or so. These particles were really created in a moment of collision. So the kinetic energy was transformed into mass. And I was reading once an article in the Zeit uh, about, uh, from a physicist about particle physics. And it was a very good article, but in the very end he stated that all the findings and this paradox nature of quantum mechanics uh, is totally irrelevant because you only find it under these extreme conditions in the laboratory as such as uh, uh, town. And I found that an interesting uh, misconception because, of course, it is difficult to see these things and often they are happening on very small scales, but they really describe the nature of everything surrounding us. And luckily this decade brought these transformations really to cosmic scales. And what we see here is the collision of two black holes. It's just a sketch. And it all started here at the LIGO facility in the US. Um, LIGO is just a four kilometer long tunnel that contains uh, mirrors and uh, laser light traveling between them. And with this you can measure distances between these mirrors and insane accuracy. So yeah, you can go to a ten thousandth part of uh, the diameter of a proton. This is how accurate they can measure the distances between these mirrors. And what they're supposed to do is measure gravitational waves which travel through space and then they come to Earth and they compress Earth a little bit. Yeah? So the effect of the um, gravitational wave is a, a little variation in the distance between these mirrors. Um, but you need two of these facilities because any truck would, that would drive by would create a much s a larger signal than a gravitational wave. So there were two of these uh, facilities at a distance of 3,000 kilometers in order to cancel out the noise. And they turned this device on on the 12th of September of 2015 and didn't even take two days until they saw this signal here. So it's an oscillation that is increasing in amplitude but also in frequency. And what that describes is the collision of two black holes surrounding each other, getting faster and faster, nearly reaching the speed of light and then finally colliding. Each of these black holes had this mass of approximately 30 times the mass of our Sun and the whole thing happened luckily well, like one billion years ago. So the signal traveled for one billion years before it was measured by LIGO just being switched on. And what's fascinating about this process is that in this moment three times the mass of our Sun sort of disappeared which means it was transformed into gravitational waves. But that means it was one million times the mass of our planet Earth. And just to remind you, in the biggest explosion I was showing you before that ever happened on Earth, there were two kilograms of mass transformed into motion. So this, uh, yeah, this is really a show where you don't want to sit in the first row. It was quite good that it was one billion light years away. And it was not the only event that was observed. If you look on the web page currently, they saw 90 
of these events. So to me, this is really the, the scientific breakthrough of the millennium, I would say. Um, just that obviously they didn't have such a good public re relation because you hardly heard anything in normal media about it. Um, but it really opened the door to a completely new kind of physics because before there was no hint that there is such a thing as a black hole, that they really exist. There was no proof of gravitational waves. They were predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity, but never observed before then. And also it was the I think one of the very first proofs of uh, this theory itself, except maybe for gravitational lenses. So it was really a massive breakthrough. So now we come to the second bullet point of magic, which is uh, about the separation of things. And it also starts with Albert Einstein. And as I mentioned before, he disliked quantum physics because of the lack of causes because of the undeterministic nature of quantum mechanics. Yeah, his quote expressing that pretty well is God, God doesn't throw dice. So he wanted to prove quantum mechanics being wrong, but instead he actually opened the door to very fascinating observations. And in order to understand that, we first have to have a short look in how normal interaction works. Yeah, here's a little illustration showing uh, the principle of a repulsive force. Just two people standing on ice skates and by throwing a heavy ball from one to another both get a momentum that causes a repulsion. And that is the principle that every interaction, any communication, any ex uh, force is based on. It's the exchange of something. And therefore, it can ha happen only with the speed of light. Yeah, because that's the maximum, that's the absolute speed limit. And Einstein wanted to show that quantum mechanics is wrong, so he did together with Podolsky and Rosen, two other physicists, a Gedanken experiment to prove that it's wrong. And it uh, starts, or it's easily explained with this uh, nuclei, nucleus that decays into two parts. Yeah, they, they can travel for a long time. Let's say one travels to Mars, the other to Venus, so really infinitely far away from each other. And if quantum mechanics would be right, if I change something one, the other would perceive it immediately. Yeah, so this would happen instantaneous in the very same moment. That means it would not happen by the exchange of anything without any physical connection. And for Einstein, it was totally clear that this shows that quantum mechanics must be wrong. And it was the, the Austrian physicist Anton Zeilinger that uh, took the mission to investigate this phenomenon. And um, I think he would be an actually a much better beer bottle label. So I would probably prefer Anton's entangled Pilsner more than Higgs boson ale. Um, but he really managed to to prove this ghost interaction over quite a significant distance between two Canary Islands. And it would be difficult to extend this further if you stay in the atmosphere because, because of the interaction with the air. The quantum correlations are weakened more and more. But Chinese scientists were sending the signal over via satellite and thereby could reach a distance of 1,200 kilometers. Which is very impressive, but I somehow like this more recent experiment of the Zeilinger group that they published in Nature recently, much more, where they took a beam of entangled photons, split it with a crystal into two independent uh, beams, put a camera at the end of both beams and then they insert a kind of a shield having a hole with the shape of a cat in reference to Schrodinger's cat. So it's obvious that on one side you see exactly the shape of the cat. But it turns out that also on the other side 
you also see the shape of a cat. And that was never going through this shield. Yeah, so there was an interaction with it without ever having any contact. And that really questions our perception of here being one thing, then there's nothing, and there's another thing. Nobody could tell, probably at this point, how that works, but it might have something to do with our concept of space. And um, space itself is already very interesting because what we would call space, in physics we would call that vacuum, yeah? the absence of anything. And it turns out in quantum mechanics that the, the lowest possible energy is not zero, it's higher. That means vacuum has energy. That means it has the, the potential to, to produce something. And it happens all the time and everywhere that out of space for no other reasons except for this ground energy. So it's being possible out of nowhere pairs of these particles or antiparticles appear exist for exceedingly short time determined by this energy time uncertainty and then disappear back into space. Additionally now we have also the Higgs field uh, being omnipresent everywhere. So it seems like uh, space is not really that empty and I think we're just at the beginning of understanding uh, space as so such. So I would like to conclude here a little bit because what we looked at is was when we zoom into reality, if we look very carefully, very accurately, all the things that we label normally or we, we would describe reality, they sort of disappear. At the same time, something you would call magic, if they would happen in our normal world, becomes apparent. But if we zoom out, everything is back to normal. The magic is gone, reality is back, and we can go back and forth. So it means we really have something like two different levels of reality. On one hand, the nature of everything, where you could not really say that things truly exist. And at the same time, things appear. They appear as real by a very complex interplay of many of these particles, which then gives space to our projections, our perception. And these two levels are actually totally inseparable. And what I find pretty astonishing is that there's another, let's say, very different kind of scientists that don't use any device and they came to the same conclusion. And um, yeah, so they, they're meditating, they're kind of observing their own mind in an unbiased uh, way. And a friend of mine uh, made a movie about these people. Yeah? He went to the Himalayas to look for them sitting very high up in the mountains there. And he came there and it was obviously high in the mountains, it's very cold, so he uh, was freezing quite a bit there. And these guys sit in very thin cloth and they don't sit just for a couple of hours or so, they sit for months without ever moving away. And he asked some of them, how is that possible? How can you sit there? It's minus, so, uh, minus a few degrees Celsius. And they said, once you understand that the reality is like a dream, you're not affected by temperature anymore. And he was puzzled by that uh, reply and um, asked, but I mean, it can get so cold. It can easily get minus 20, minus 30 degrees here. How can you handle that? And then the guy says, uh, he did not understand. There is no such thing as temperature. And the statement is kind of puzzling, of course. Um, and it opens, it raises a question whether there's a kind of perception or that really, or an understanding of these things that I was just describing intellectually that really changes your perception of, your, of the world, obviously, fundamentally. And I personally don't have an answer to that question. So I will leave this uh, question with you, and I would like to close here. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>